very much and welcome for the third and final time to Brasilia, our live roundup of the day's exciting events and exciting events yet to come here from the World Congress on Huntington's Disease in Rio de Janeiro. But we just want to take a moment to thank uh, some very important people, uh, some uh, volunteers who help us translate HD Buzz, uh, which is available in 12 languages. Uh, so we heard today that there are 600 million people living in Latin America, and so there's bound to be a large number of Huntington's disease patients uh, in this uh, community. And so we're excited that a lot of the content on HD Buzz is available in both Spanish and, Spanish and Portuguese to hopefully uh, assist these families as they try to learn about their condition. And uh, all of our translation is indeed done by volunteers who give their time freely to translate uh, into languages including Spanish and Portuguese. Uh, I think there are one or two at least uh, HD Buzz translators in the audience. So if you translate for HD Buzz, please stand up. There we are. And please give them a warm round of applause. And I know that the people watching at home will, uh, a lot of translators will be watching this video and indeed translating it, and they will appreciate that round of applause. So thank you for that. Uh, and finally, uh, in our uh, preliminary remarks, a, a brief shout out for the uh, International Huntington Association. Uh, they've just elected a new board and are making a new start uh, with a big push to link together all the countries, uh, uh, agencies fighting Huntington's disease. Uh, so if you're interested and you want to get involved, please email uh, the international president, Ann Jones. Uh, her email is there. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, to the highlights of the day. Ed, uh, what stood out for you? So for me, uh, I mean, I, we talked about biomarkers yesterday. Uh, for me personally, today's highlight was a, a mention uh, in a session with uh, Tiago Mistre, uh, who unfortunately we were hoping to interview, but he had to leave. But he was talking about a uh, collection of cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF. Um, and this is a, a clear fluid which uh, bathes and surrounds the brain and spinal cord. And you can collect it by sticking a fine needle into the base of the spine. Sounds pretty gruesome. Well, it sounds much worse than it is. And when it's done by inexperienced hands, it's pretty well tolerated. And it's it's actually not that much different from a blood test, although there's a bit more fuss before and after. And of course, we both know this because you had a lumbar puncture several years ago at the hands of Dr. Blair Levitt uh, for HD research. Personally, I'm willing to do almost anything, obviously, <laughs> for HD research. Uh, and, and I had one a couple of weeks ago uh, in August uh, because we were collecting CSF and we needed control uh, uh, fluids. So I volunteered and also to see what it's like. Uh, I t tweeted the experience. In fact, this is a video of me having my... You can see the fluid dripping out there. Yeah, gruesome. Uh, and that's me uh, covered in antiseptic solution. I'm giving a thumbs up there. You're curled up like a baby. And actually, in all honesty, I felt virtually nothing. This was me. That's my spinal fluid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and if you're interested... Well, this is a round of applause for anyone who gives CSF for Huntington's disease. Uh, if you want to read uh, some of the tweets before, during, and after. That's where you can find them. And um, uh, it tastes a bit like chicken. <laughs> For the record, I did not drink my CSF. Um, OK. Uh, so this sounds like something that's uh, useful for families to do if they want to contribute. I would say so. I mean, it's certainly not for everyone. It's, it's not a typical walk in the park kind of thing to do. Um, but if you're inclined to be as helpful as possible for Huntington's research, I, and, and there happens to be a project uh, running that you can uh, sign up for, I would encourage it. And there'll certainly be more spinal fluid collections coming up because uh, measuring the levels of various molecules in the spinal fluid is certainly going to be an important way of hopefully um, uh, running trials in Huntington's disease. So one way that we can figure out if a drug is working is to see whether we see the expected changes in the spinal fluid. But in order to do that, we need to be looking at spinal fluid now. Cool. And since this is our last uh, live Brasilia session, I wanted to uh, glance ahead quickly to what's going to happen tomorrow, uh, which is a session on emerging new treatments and therapies, which is obviously a, a huge interest and, and really exciting for everyone here. Uh, Professor Bernhard Landvermeier is going to give uh, an overview, a talk of where we're at in terms of uh, therapeutic development. Uh, and uh, I'm also particularly looking forward to updates on gene silencing approaches to Huntington's disease, so switching off the harmful Huntington gene about which more in a moment when we speak to Neil Aronin. But I think in general, it sounds like we are, uh, like new treatments which have been developed specifically for HD are, are really going to be entering, and several of them are going to be entering clinical trials in the next year or two. 
yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of the fruition of decades of careful science, science that's happening, really exciting new things happening just in the next year. And our first uh, lucky interviewee, actually we're very lucky to have him with us, is uh, Jim uh, Gazella from Harvard Medical School. Now Jim is a legend among Huntington's disease researchers. Um, he was uh, critical to the discovery of the gene and all of the work that led to that. And he's remained uh, one of the most prominent researchers on the genetics of Huntington's disease. So please welcome him to the stage, Jim. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you for joining us. Have a seat on our opulent yet minimalist couch. So, Jim, we're going to start with a really easy question. What is a gene? Uh, so that's a more complicated question than you'd think. Yeah. Um, but I'll try to give you the current definition because it's actually a moving target. Uh, the, the DNA in an individual carries a code for making the various components of the cells of the individual. And to do that, it has to have its message copied, and it gets copied into a related molecule called RNA. And then that RNA is read by the machinery of the cell in many cases to make a protein. So the current definition of a gene is that bit of DNA that makes an RNA that is functional. Because some RNAs, as it turns out, don't get made into proteins. But they still do things in the cell that are still being worked out as to exactly what they do. Is that clear enough now? That's exceptionally clear. I think that does deserve a round of applause. That is actually, and I did know this, that's actually an extraordinarily complicated question. And a bit of a, what did you say, curveball, right? That's the American thing to say, a bit of a curveball. A googly, we would say, although I don't know anything about cricket, so I don't know where that word came from. Um, okay, so that's what a gene is. And in my very, very simplistic way, if I were to say a gene is a recipe for a protein, would you be very cross with me, very angry with me? Uh, that was, I think, probably the best accepted definition up until about five years ago. Okay. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. Probably when so, you went to school. Then. Yeah, yeah, when I was at uh, nursery school. Okay, so... Um, <laughs> So, and of course, the gene that is closest to the hearts of everyone in this audience and everyone watching at home is the, the, the gene that causes Huntington's disease, which is the Huntington gene. Well, yeah, if you believe that nomenclature. Okay. It's actually the HTT gene. HTT and gene. Huntington is the product of that gene. Okay. Every day is a school day. Okay. Um, so, since we know that that gene produces the protein that causes Huntington's disease, why do we need to think about any other genes? Well, it's like uh, if you think about a car and you're driving the car and all you have in your hands is the steering wheel. Is that better? Perfect. Oh my God, that gets <laughs> so loud when you do that. If all you had in your hands was the steering wheel and there was nothing else there, you wouldn't get very far. Uh, the Huntington is a protein. It matters. It does things, but it does it in the context of a lot of other proteins and other components of the cell. Uh, so you can't consider it by itself. You've got to consider it as part of the machine that it works within. And that's why we've got to worry about the others. Now, as it turns out, um, the others are not constant. The others vary just like Huntington varies. They don't vary in in ways all the time that cause disease. Sometimes they just vary in normal differences between individuals. And so one of the things to think about when we think about Huntington's, not as a worry, but as an opportunity, is if we can figure out how Huntington works in different circumstances of people who have variations and find those where it doesn't cause as bad a disease, maybe a later onset or uh, a less severe course, um, then we can use that information. So, so we don't have to just worry about it in terms of how does Huntington work, but maybe as taking an opportunity to make it uh, a, a clue to a treatment. Cool. And, and that's what a genetic modifier is, right? It's a gene which alters the... Well, you tell me. Well, now, you see, you've, you've taken the tick 
off of genetic. I'm sorry about that. So a genetic modifier isn't necessarily a gene. It is a variation in the sequence of the DNA that when you find it, you don't immediately know how it works necessarily, but its presence results in a difference in what you see in an individual. So if, if what you're looking at is the symptoms of Huntington's disease in an individual, and you find that those people who have a certain sequence in their DNA never show psychiatric symptoms, for example, that would be a genetic modifier. And you'd then have to go in and look at that DNA sequence and say, how does this work? Does it work because it's part of a gene? Or does it work in some other way because it's regulating something? So it's complex. So it's complex, but tremendous opportunity because looking at the genes is finite. There's only a limited amount of DNA in a person, about three billion bases. You can look at all of that at once. It's, a, it's very different than looking at the universe of environmental factors that might be involved because you can essentially look at a closed system and gradually eliminate all the differences as either not meaning anything or being very important. Now, so you were instrumental in the discovery of the genetic marker 30 years ago and the gene 20 years ago. We have a lot of genes. You can imprison them all in a lab and study them until you have your answers. So, do we have genetic modifiers? Do we know what they are? Uh, we do not have genetic modifiers that we know precisely what they are in humans and precisely what their effects are. There, is, there are proof of principle genetic modifiers in uh, knock-in mouse models where specific genes have been found that modify the disease. Uh, there are candidate modifiers that have been found in humans that represent DNA sequences that look like they're having an effect, but it's at a very early stage in the sense that finding uh, spurious results when you're looking at millions and millions of possibilities all at the same time uh, is very frequent. And so you have to go out of your way to prove that what you think is true, in fact, is not a spurious result. We're in the midst of that right now as part of a, a worldwide collaboration that is looking at thousands of Huntington's disease patients. And uh, people who follow HD Buzz or follow the news from these sorts of meetings very closely might be familiar with, the, with what's been happening in the past couple of years, which is that we, we thought we had found some genes that looked pretty good, and it looks like maybe a, a more careful relook at that has, has maybe taken those off the table. What happened there? Well, the... the uh, way that you would look for modifiers has changed with improving technology. It used to be, probably up until uh, six or seven years ago, that you could really only pick one gene and look at it and say, does, does this vary between people? And so you might, in fact, come to the point that it does vary, and that in a small sample of a few hundred people, it looks like the people who have a certain form of the gene have, let's say, later onset of the disease. But you're studying that gene without taking into account the 25,000 other genes that you haven't looked at. And so we now have the ability to look at them all simultaneously. And it, and it comes down to an analogy that, that I used earlier today in one of my talks, which is that if you think about flipping a coin, if you flip a coin eight times and get heads eight times in a row, you're going to think that that's a coin that is fixed. But if you flip it a thousand times, you're almost guaranteed during that thousand times to find eight heads in a row at some point. So it's like that with genetic modifiers. If you only look at a few and then home in on the ones that look positive, you, you've picked things that may not be true. But if you've looked at all of them, and then looked at only the ones that are positive, you're going to find things that are real. We now have the ability to look at all of them. So by, by taking that new technology and looking back at the old ones, we found that, in fact, we were being optimistic about the old ones. So in a sense, I mean, it may sound like, good, like bad news that, we've, that there are things that used to be modifiers, but maybe not. But actually, my way of looking at it would be to return to the idea that science is cumulative and actually what's happened is that we now have better tools for distinguishing between, between spurious results and, and re really solid results. We have better tools and the positive in it is also that 
in the past when you identified a modifier that you thought was real, you then had to go and prove it biologically. You had to go into a biological system and study it. And, and doing that is a lot of work, a lot of expense, and a lot of time, and isn't always definitive. Whereas with the genetics now, because you can look at everything at once, you can come to a definitive result without ever going into the biological system by pure statistics. Mm -hmm. and, and then when you do go to that work of going to the biological system, you know you're working on something real. So, so you've also avoided work by now eliminating those things uh, that, that enable you to go directly to the, uh, uh, the biological system when you don't need to. You, you've gone away from it. You can get the proof that something's real, and now just study it. Saves a lot of time once you've got it. Fantastic. And so the work goes on with huge sample sets with thousands of patients who've donated their DNA, and you're optimistic. I'm very optimistic. Uh, and, you know, that said, it's just a starting point because the way that these genetic modifier studies work, you don't look at a sample and find something, and then it stops. The more samples you have, the more you're going to find, and the more samples you have that have different characteristics of the disease described in them, the more different kinds of things that you can find. So it's a cumulative process where the initial modifiers that you find give you something to work on that you know changes the disease, but you also know that as you look at more samples, you're going to find more things that change the disease and put together a better picture of exactly how to change it. Thank you very much, Jim. Thanks for joining us. Best of luck with Thank the ongoing you. work. Now we're looking forward to a scientist who's speaking tomorrow and uh, who works on this hot new uh, gene silencing drugs, Neil Ronan from the University of Massachusetts. So, uh, gene silencing. Uh, everyone, uh, I think as Ed and I talk to patients, this is, this is definitely the thing we hear about the most. Um, but a lot of people, of course, who will be watching won't, won't know what this is. So can you give me the sort of a uh, quick definition of, of this approach for therapy? Well, uh, I'm glad that uh, Jim had organized the DNA and the RNA and the protein because it makes my line of reasoning a lot easier. Uh, gene silencing is actually a, w a way to prevent the messenger RNA to make the protein. So we have this HTT gene that makes this intermediate molecule and then that turns into the protein. That's correct. And, uh, and the uh, endogenous or the natural RNAs that do this are those small non-coding RNAs that Jim mentioned. Uh, they don't make proteins. They don't make proteins, but they do make small RNAs that can recognize messenger RNA and regulate them. So they regulate normally. They regulate how much of the messenger RNA is made to then make protein. So we, the idea is to sort of hijack this natural process that exists in cells and instead tell it, hey, go get rid of the bad Huntington gene. That, that's correct. Okay. There, there are two natural processes. Uh, the first one that was discovered was actually in worms. And these RNAs were made into two different strands that were connected. And that's called an SI, or small interfering RNA. Now, we don't make those we make what's called the microRNA, which is about the same size as the sRNA, but there's only one strand. And we have probably close to a thousand of them. And the majority, uh, I'd say two thirds, are in the brain. So um, on top of the complexity of these normal things that we make, there's also the complexity, I think we hear from patients often that they hear about ASOs and RNAi, there's these different um, molecules that seem to be doing the same thing. So could you just explain briefly the different approaches? Sure. The ASO is a synthetic uh, 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 molecule that's made mostly of DNA. So that's what genes are made of too. And they're about the same size. They're single strand, about the same size as an siRNA or the microRNA. But they work in a very different way. The ASOs get into a cell and then combined with a, uh, uh, an enzyme or a protein that cleaves other proteins called RNase H. The, there are advantages to the ASOs and there are advantages to the microRNAs or the siRNAs. 
ASOs usually require a lot more to get into a cell, and it's more difficult, as you know, because you were a participant in some of these studies, it's more difficult uh, to know ahead of time how it's going to work. The siRNAs and the microRNAs can actually been, be experimentally designed and can work with much smaller concentrations. So one thing I think, um, and I was going to bring this up, just in the interest of full disclosure, I work on sort of a different technology than you've worked on. And I, I think sometimes when patients and families hear that, they think, this is so stupid, they're, they're competing in some sense against each other. And I think as a scientist, I naturally think it's actually a really good thing. And I wonder if you could, you could speak to that, how you feel about that. How do I feel about the competition? <laughs> I don't know. But is it good for science or is it bad for science? It's actually, they could be complementary. Yeah. Uh, as it turns out in some early studies, the ASOs may get to certain areas of the brain better than small RNAs or RNAs that are embedded in a virus that we put in. We'll talk about that tomorrow. So you can envisage that in the future there could be treatment with an ASO complementary to those with the RNAi. And in a way we wouldn't have known this if different labs weren't working on different approaches. Correct. At the beginning. Yes. Yeah. And so uh, we've read uh, your name uh, a couple times in connection with, of all things, uh, sheep and doing research in sheep. So could you explain like just why on earth would you want to study sheep? And I'll give you the explanation that I gave my mother who said, I thought you went to medical school and I'm working on sheep, um, and you could understand that. So uh, CHDI has organized a colony of sheep that have the mutant Huntington gene. It's a transgenic sheep, and it was put together. This is a worldwide effort. It was put together by a laboratory headed by Richard Fall uh, and, uh, and Russell Snell in uh, Auckland, so in New Zealand. The sheep are grown and reared in an Australian sheep farm, which we actually visited. Um, and it looked like a sheep farm to me, but what would I know? And, uh, and we have organized treatment of these sheep with an adeno-associated virus that has a microRNA or small RNA that will target the mutant Huntington. And the reason we're doing that is we want to establish safety because you hear that all the time. We need to show that these AAV siRNAs or microRNAs are safe and don't damage the brain, and also some efficacy, how much knockdown or elimination of the gene we can expect. So how well do they work in the bigger brain? Yeah, we, we plan to do this in late November, and we have about 120 sheep to our disposal. Brilliant. Well, we'll leave it there. Gentlemen, thank you both very much.